American Bar Association is pleased to have with us today the Orange County District Attorney Todd Spitzer. Uh, District Attorney Spitzer's career has been devoted to public service. Um, in law school at UC Hastings, he was awarded the George Moscone Fellowship for Public Service. Um, after graduating from Hastings and before joining the Orange County District Attorney, he was a California State Assembly member and an Orange County Supervisor. And something that impressed me about his resume, because I was also a teacher, he served as a teacher for a little bit of time as well. Now, uh, District Attorney Spitzer's career has been dedicated to victims' rights. As Orange County District Attorney, he has been a strong advocate for victims' rights. He played a pivotal role in uh, Mary's Marcy. Marcy's Law for All. Uh, it's a victims, uh, victims' initiative, a victims' rights initiative. Uh, his advocacy for Orange County citizens has reached out to our community, even though, uh, as well as even though advocacy from the office of the DA. Uh, in the, let's go right into our, our Sean Mizrahi. Um, a lot of you are familiar with Sean's, uh, Cheyenne's story. Last year, uh, in 2015, Cheyenne was brutally murdered outside a bar in South County. Um, only 22 years old. The perpetrator was a known white supremacist and he had recently been released uh, from prison, from my understanding, for a similar crime where he was an accomplice. So, even though witnesses saw the white supremacist refer to Cheyenne as a terrorist and other racial slurs, um, his, this, uh, District Attorney Spitzer's predecessor chose not to prosecute the incident as a hate crime. And this is kind of an ugly part of our uh, things that we've heard in our community. We've, at some point, a lot of us Middle Easterns, Iranians, have been referred to as terrorists or other mean things. Um, as we know, Sean is not just an anomaly or a one-off situation. Uh, we've seen a rise in hate-motivated crimes and violence across the country. And having an advocate for our community has never been more important uh, because we know that, it's, that we need to be tough on hate crimes. That's why we're pleased to have District Attorney Spitzer with us today to tell us more about his mission. So please join me in welcoming District Attorney Todd Spitzer. Okay, it's my business after anyway. You know, it's really good to be here and um, Cheyenne's family is here, his mom's here, and his uh, uncle is here, and their advocate is here, and um, I know them very, very well, and I'll be talking about that a little bit today. And before I get into my comments, because I'm going to be talking um, about politics today, social media, the internet, uh, irresponsibility, hate crimes, I'm going to try to mix up a lot of stuff, not only because um, I think it's interesting, and I'm going to try to advocate a particular, what I think is kind of an interesting point of view about hate crime, the internet, and politicians. But uh, many of you don't even know me. And so before I get into my comments, I do feel it's really important for me to tell you a little bit about the office. Um, one of the uh, either young attorneys or about to be attorney uh, came up and was so excited because she interviewed with, with my office this week. And so that's super exciting for me because I've been a lawyer for 30 years. And so I did that too, right? I worked in different offices. I always wanted to be a prosecutor. And so when I see somebody who has that level of enthusiasm that I did 30 years ago, it really does please me very much. So thank you for coming up and talking to me that. So let me, let me just tell you about this law firm. I run the largest law firm in Orange County. <laughs> and don't anybody try to compete with me, okay? I have 300 lawyers, 800 employees, $150 million a year budget and growing. Uh, I have 150 police officers, sworn personnel, who assist all the DAs in our investigation, and then support staff. And we bring not only criminal cases, which most of you are used to hearing about, we also bring 
civil cases, mostly under 17200 of the Business and Pro Professions Code, which is uh, the Attorney General statute. And some of you try to bring those. You can bring those as a private Attorney General, um, but that's really been limited by law because of abuses by civil attorneys in the past. Mostly the Trevor Law Group, which was that Beverly Hills firm that was suing uh, Cypre, so they had no victim, no client, and they ruined it for everybody, and they were disbarred. I was a member of the State Assembly Judiciary Committee at the time, and I got to basically cross-examine those lawyers in a public hearing, and the things they admitted, I have no idea why they were willing to say what they said, but it resulted in their disbarment. So all I can tell you, if you're ever summoned in front of a state legislative committee or congressional committee, you should always consult with counsel, okay? That's just my <laughs> stupid advice. Um, so the mission of the district attorney's office, I changed the mission statement just a little bit when I came into office. I added crime victims to the mission statement because believe it or not, the word crime victim was not in the mission statement of the district attorney's office. And that'll tie in a little bit to what we're gonna talk about today because that's what we do. Um, you heard in my intro, uh, Marcy's Law. Marcy was murdered in 1983 in Santa Barbara, UC Santa Barbara. She had just graduated and her, she broke up with her boyfriend and he came and he shot her in the face with a shotgun. And so her brother is Henry Nicholas who founded Broadcom with Dr. Samueli. Of course, he's a billionaire several times over and I ran the statewide campaign to add Marcy's Law into the California Constitution and then I co-wrote it. So I've been a victim's advocate for a very, very long time and so we added crime victims. And then over here, it used to say create a sense of security and I took out the word sense because in my opinion, I don't care if you have a sense of feeling safe, I want you to be safe. So whether you have a sense of feeling safe is it quite frankly irrelevant. What's relevant is if you are actually safe. And so my number one job as district attorney is to keep this community safe with all of my employees. And so this is just like, I mean, this is just the cryptic organizational chart of the office. And it just, it gives you a sense of all of our operations and everything we're involved in. I mean, we have a science and technology unit. We're actively uh, taking people's DNA and analyzing it. We're solving crimes like never before. We have genealogical DNA experts. I mean, law enforcement has come a long way. But the other thing that many of you in this room should be concerned about, about law enforcement techniques, is that we're handling these new techniques responsibly because the ability for the government to invade in your privacy and to know more about you than ever before is quite frankly scary to me. And the reason I think this country is so amazing, and we'll get into that a little bit today, um, it's so amazing and I think the peop reason people want to get here, and you've had these panels this morning about blocks, right, with visas and things like that and immigration to this country, people want to come here because of the amazing opportunity, but I think people generally believe in our government and they understand we have certain protections and rights to protect our privacy. <clears throat> I'll submit to you, because obviously it's very controversial right now about where the government is going, but I'm the one that has to sign off on whether or not we wiretap somebody in this county. So I'm the one that has to approve a wiretap before it goes to a judge to sign that warrant. I'm the one in the county who decides whether we're gonna seek death in a death penalty case. I'm the one in the county who decides if we're going to use an informant in a case. So the responsibilities that I have on my shoulders, even though I get advice and input from very, very smart, well-educated people, it's a pretty enormous responsibility. So my goal, I have one goal this year, right? I mean, people who get elected, they tend to overstate what they're trying to accomplish in their first year in office. And I've been in office 10 months. Obviously, we're going to talk about Cheyenne's case, but Orange County had the worst mass murder in Orange County history about six years ago in Seal Beach. Eight people were gunned down at a salon, hair salon. Ex-husband came in, killed his wife and her co-workers. And the district attorney's office, because of cheating in that case and the misuse of informants in violation of the Sixth Amendment and the right to counsel under a case called Messiah, which is 
you're not allowed to talk to somebody after they're represented by counsel. Like, I know we all kind of learned that in law school, but apparently the district attorney's office missed that chapter. And so they were kicked off that case, sadly, and the, it was turned over to the attorney general's office, and the death penalty was taken off the table as a remedy. Irrespective of how you feel about the death penalty, if a person comes in and slaughters eight people in cold blood, at least we should have a conversation if they're eligible for the death penalty. And it's ultimately, you all know, that's the one sentence, right? Judges hand down all sentences. But the only sentence in California that the people hand down is the death penalty. It's a jury question. So that was taken away from the public's right to weigh in on that case because of misconduct by the district attorney's office. I'm going to talk about hate crimes, so let me introduce it this way. All of you know that Elizabeth Warren is 100% Cherokee Indian, right? <laughs> you, you guys don't know that? So she submitted her DNA, and it turns out she's not 100% Cherokee Indian. She, I think, what is it now? It's like it may be 1% or something like that. What is it? 0.1, okay, it's 0.1%, I was off by a factor, is that 10 or 100, I don't know, it was, I was an English major, okay. Um, so what happens? Lindsey Graham decides he's gonna have his DNA taken so he can find out if he has more Cherokee Indian than Elizabeth Warren. Because obviously he was in a position of trying to embarrass a candidate for the president and a colleague in the United States Senate as against his own DNA. So he goes on Fox and Friends, Fox and Hounds, I think it's called, and, and he is interviewed. And many of you saw this because it's on the website for the, so for the organization. And he's talking about his DNA and other issues. This is in October, October 18th of last year. And at the very end, he said, they said, well, when are you going to get your DNA results? He said, oh, I'm getting them in two weeks. They said, well, would you come back on our show? I'm sorry to turn my back on you. Would you come back on our show and tell everybody the results of your DNA test? And he said, absolutely, but hopefully it won't show that I'm Iran Iranian. It was a completely ridiculous throwaway very end of the interview, like last five seconds, completely inappropriate. I, no idea where that came from, but it, it's kind of like when a therapist gives you a free association exam, uh, that test, right? This word, what's this word, right? We, we've all taken those words, even if you've played them while you're drinking. I mean, it could be a drinking game as far as I'm concerned. But the thing is, is that when you do free association, Things come out of you which are inherently truthful, and sometimes you say things that you didn't mean to because it's a spontaneous response. And it was an ugly, irresponsible, horrible response. He was immediately, he wasn't chastised by the host, but the host said, oh, you mean they're leaders, right? Because the host, I think, was even taken aback. I want you to appreciate something about speech. Our politicians today are engaging in such horrific speech through social media that what they're doing is they're creating an environment for other observers around the country who are not educated, who are part of movements which are already racist and have particular points of view, to have permission to hold the views that they hold. I, was, I listened to TED Talk podcasts and I was listening to one last night. I didn't even understand it. I mean, sometimes I listen to these TED Talks and I have to play them a couple times. I'm not dumb, but sometimes they're way over my head. This one was making the argument that we built great cities. And when we build cities, we have architects and urban planners and people that come together. And what do they do when they plan cities? They plan places where people hold discourse. Town squares, coffee shops, right? There's places that people mingle and interact in a social way to have interaction through immediacy, through arm's length transactions. The internet's the opposite. It's not planned, it's a free for all. It's not screened, it's irresponsible. People can say whatever they want and there's no place to peg things 
so that people can react and interpret information appropriately. And about 80% of our public now is getting their news from the internet. So we're, we are at great risk and great peril. And so I want to talk to you about what's happening in Orange County because hate crime is going up year after year after year, the last four years in particular. And when I was a member of the Board of Supervisors, we sanctioned this report. This is the 2018 report. And 31% of Orange County's population is foreign born. 51% of foreign born are now US citizens. 46% of our county speaks a language other than English. And we have 80 faiths in this county. This is not the county that the John Burt Society was influential in, in the, you know, the 40s and the 50s. This is not the Orange County that Dr. Beckman founded the Lincoln Club in the 1950s when uh, there was a very strong, wealthy, influential, conservative group of men that ran this county in those early days. This is a very, very different place. And it's a blessing it's a different place. It's good that it's a different place. And one of the things that I want to talk to you about, especially as I look around the room and I see and kind of, you know, using a little bit of deciphering about there's a lot of young lawyers in this room and a lot of women in this room, which is fantastic. And one of the things I want to tell you as a guy who's been in office formally since 1992 and I've never been out of office since 1992 consecutively in this county in some office, you can never give up your position and you always have to be an activist. You, you can never give up a position of offense. And so you've got to be part of this conversation that understands that when a US senator, make, when Lindsey Graham makes a statement like that, you had to put that on the website. You had to show the YouTube video. And you had to make sure that that was part of the conversation. So hate crime has been increasing every year since 2015. And I honestly think, and I'm saying this as a Republican, I honestly think it's because of Twitter and what the President of the United States has done on Twitter. <clears throat> And I don't, I want you to understand something. Here's a reality, here's a president who obviously is a business person. Arguably, I don't want to get into how he made his money, dad's money, whatever. But he had a reality TV show. And he knows how to use the media to get his message out. He is a master at using the media. And don't think that this fake news and tension with the media isn't exactly what he wants to have happen. It's not like, oh, please be nice to me so I can stop criticizing you. Can't we all get along? It's an important part of the mechanism. But what it's doing to the entire country, it's taking people not like us, because we are highly educated, sophisticated members of the community. And we understand rhetoric, and I hope we can decipher all this manipulation. But 80% of the population cannot. And that's what I deal with. That I have to deal with all the people who take this rhetoric and then turn around and use it for bad purposes. So 12% increase in hate crimes, 37% uh, since uh, from 2017. And you can just see the bar chart. So the broken line, this one, are hate crimes. And the upper crime are hate incidents. And basically, what's the distinction between a hate crime and a hate incident? So a hate incident is an, in, is an, an act that occurs because of somebody's hateful being. A hate crime, I have to prove in a court beyond a reasonable doubt that that act was related to something related to hate. I have to prove that connection. So that's why the line is lower because the burden of showing somebody did a criminal act because of hate is a much heavier burden than just showing that something about them created an incident that is related to hate. <clears throat> so 
These are just some examples. A Muslim woman was wearing a hijab and she was given the middle finger and called baby killer and trash. Um, biracial couple <clears throat> um, gave deposit to a white male to fix her patio. The person never did the job, retained the deposit. When the wife asked for the money, the male messenger, her, you and your nigger uh, can F off race trader. And then a Christian church door was graffitied with God hates, and that's faggots. Below the graffiti was a deposit of waste matter, actual waste, right, human waste. If you are any member, okay, the other thing I want to talk about is if you look different physically, if you have, you know, certain physical characteristics, in this county, I'm, I can only talk about our county, but you're more susceptible because on the surface, people will make certain assumptions. And people who are racist in this county, especially uh, white supremacists, hell's angels, things like that, they can't tell the difference between anybody who looks like they come anywhere from any place in particular from the Middle East, okay? I mean, they, people have been called certain names Muslim and they're not Muslim, okay? They're Iranian or they're Iranian, they're Jewish. Like people who don't know, don't know. And then six, so, but if you're a member of the Jewish faith, Middle Eastern community or Hispanic community, Latino community, you are a target in this county. So I tell people, when you get up in the morning, you go out to get the newspaper, and I bet you, I'm going to describe a behavior, and most of you probably mess this up. You go and you push your garage door opener, and you just kind of are spaced out, and you just kind of do your business in that garage. And what I'm telling you is, man, when you open that garage door, you better just stand there and survey the landscape and do nothing else but see what's out there for you. And when you get out, come out of Starbucks, the coffee in your hand, you need to have your head up instead of down with your phone. And when you're walking around, you need to have your hands free so that you can protect yourself if somebody's coming after you. Like you need to, all of you just need to use just general good tactics about thinking about how you operate on the street. Because you, all of you just need to look at in the mirror and you're all susceptible. I'm susceptible because I'm the district attorney. I have to, I have a whole security detail. I mean, the, the, I have, get threats all the time. I have a whole book of pictures of people who are threatening me and send me death threats. So we're, we're, a lot of us are in the same boat, and I'm just saying you just need to be careful. But in particular, these groups are vulnerable. So this is just a chart that kind of breaks that out. But you can see, <clears throat> I don't want to get too close on that side. So on the top it says white, Muslim. Look at the bar chart for Muslim. I mean, just it goes to 13%, but see how far it extends out. Middle Eastern, uh, 6%. Latino, 6%. Jewish um, is now 15%. African American, 4%. Asian American, 3%. So th this is just another representation of... Uh, this shows the breakdown of the kind of crimes that are happening by offense. So simple assault, aggravated assault, uh, murder, terrorist threat. So terrorist threats is the biggest category. The next biggest category is criminal threats. And then vandalism is, is very significant. <clears throat> and uh, we don't, so I wrote a piece in the Orange County Register uh, not too long ago, maybe two or three months ago, because I was having a problem. So this is what I decided to do. When I got elected, I said, I'm going to make an appearance in every hate crime case in this county myself with my prosecutor, because I'm not taking, I can't take over every case. But I wanted to show up, because I wanted the judges to know that hate is up over, over, year over year over year over year, and it's not getting better. And when the DA walks in a courtroom, it kind of freaks the bench out, because they always want to know why you're there. So I go into chambers, I'm like, you know, we, 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 all right, what's the case worth? Defense counsel's there. Oh, judge, you know, my client, he's just misunderstood. He didn't mean to use a razor blade on that, you know, person's face. I'll give an example. This, this op-ed is based on this case. African-American woman who's pregnant is sitting on a bus bench in Fullerton. A white supremacist with a swastika um, etched into his uh, belly tattoo uh, is running around with his shirt off. He runs up to her and says, 
there's no kids here, so I'm good, I guess. Hey, you fucking nigger, I'm going to drop your baby. Because niggers shouldn't have babies. And then he starts chasing her. She had pepper spray. Remember I warned you, do something to protect yourself. So she has pepper spray. She pepper sprays him. And he retreats. She calls the police. Police come out, but they can't find him. She goes back to the bus bench. Knucklehead shows up again and threatens her again, and he's arrested. He is a third striker. Three strikes. So he's looking. This is the kind of guy you do not want on the street for as long as possible. And what are his other crimes? He slashed a Hispanic man's face open because that man didn't have a cigarette one night, right? And he did another hate crime against another victim. So this is his third hate crime. So I go and tell the judge, 25 to life. This, I go, judge, if there is a poster child for hate in this county, this is the dude. And this guy's dangerous. And what's so dangerous about him? He indiscriminately attacks people of color. Like, you don't, like a lot of times, if you've ever been a victim of crime, let's say you've been in a bad relationship and you're, it was a bad breakup, at least you know that person might be violent against me. So you take precautions as against a known potential assailant. And I'm not saying it's better. I'm just saying at least you have it, some knowledge. In this case, this guy's just going up indiscriminately to somebody. He doesn't like the way you look, which means anybody could be terrorized at any time without warning and suffer serious injuries. The judge struck the strikes. So then I went and told him we wrote a brief and we just laid him out. And he changed the offer a little bit, but not much. So I wrote an op-ed in the Orange County Register. I laid his ass out. <clears throat> I mentioned him by name. Now, you guys know as lawyers, when it comes to criticizing the bench, we have to be really careful, right? <laughs> and you guys do because, you know, you're in court and the judge gives you an adverse ruling. I mean, you can't say much, but I'm the elected district attorney. And I have additional responsibilities about protecting the public. And if a judge is not following the law or bending over backwards not to protect the public, I have a duty to point that out. So that judge is no longer sitting in that courtroom. He got transferred against his will, quite frankly. And I don't know all the back channel story. And quite frankly, I don't want to know. But I didn't want him judging my cases anymore. OK? So is that, if you look at what I just told you, is that a pretty serious um, act by me to write an op-ed about hate, explaining hate crime has gone up? In our county, and it's unacceptable. Talk about the human relations report, and I lay out a judge and I explain exactly the facts of the case. There is great risk and peril to doing that. And I'm going to tell you something. If you didn't go to law school to take risks and put yourself in harm's way, then I don't know why you became a lawyer. Seriously. Like, if you want to do transactional work and, you know, whatever, God bless you. But if you want to change society in the world and you want to make a difference, then you got to get your hands dirty. And sometimes it's extremely unpleasant and it has risks, but you got to do it. So here's the Los Angeles Times article. They covered the story and they covered it. Now, if you're a judge who I lay out in the story, it's not pleasant, but you don't think the colleagues on the bench are reading those stories? So, hey, man, they don't want to be the next person I talk about in the next article. So one of the rules of activism is that when you take action, it has other potential impacts that extend beyond your initial act, which is sometimes why you are an activist. And that's how you make a difference. Here's the Orange County Register, five-year sentence. Remember, it was 25 to life, which means you do 25 hard, and then you're up for parole. And you may not get parole. You got to go in front of the parole board. Five years for after his third assault of an innocent victim. I mean, look at this guy. He should go to 25 just for looking like that. <laughs> <laughs> that was a completely uncalled for comment, so I apologize. 
So down in South County, Whole Foods in Laguna Beach, we just got an excellent conviction there. Um, 23 year old uh, assaulted. And, and so we're gonna watch that sentencing and we're gonna write sentencing briefs. And we're hoping the judge is gonna take that case seriously. So I think we've changed the whole conversation. So let's talk about Tambor. <clears throat> so during the campaign last year, um, I was deeply offended that this case, uh, there were, the family of course and the community were making arguments that there should have been a hate crime enhancement added to the charges against Tambor. And you heard the facts of the case. What, what needs to be explained is before <clears throat> Cheyenne was stabbed, just outside, right at the threshold of the door to the bar, <clears throat> the whole kind of leading up to the event was a friend, an associate, a female, who went out to smoke a cigarette out in the smoking area, and Cheyenne was out there as well smoking, and they got into it, and there was an exchange. We have video, but there's no audio. But, th but there were witnesses that heard really negative, you know, camel jockey kind of stuff like that. So here's Cheyenne. And so um, he obviously, um, we know he lost his life. And so during the campaign, the woman, so Tambor had been charged with murder, no, no uh, uh, enhancement at that point. And then um, we had, I joined the family for a candlelight vigil and a press conference on the courthouse steps. And the reason I did that is because I do believe very strongly in activism. I believe that when you get involved, it makes a big difference. Now, I want to tell you something. It won't make a person like me file a case that shouldn't be filed, because I don't have the evidence. I mean, think about that. That would be outrageous. I mean, it would be unethical, and I'd lose my bar car. But if somebody is not, if justice is not being done, then you have to say something. And in this case, the woman who set up the whole set of circumstances was not being charged. And I thought that was outrageous because after the event where, and Cheyenne fell in the bar, <clears throat> they fled and she went and got her car and she was the getaway driver for Tambor. So at the very least, she should have been charged as an accessory after the fact. And I got to prove that she drove Tambor away knowing that he did what he did. I don't think we're gonna have a problem proving that. So the statute of limitations is three years. And on three days before the statute of limitations ran, my predecessor filed charges against the woman. Three days before, they had three years, and they waited till the three days before the statute was gonna run. Now that I'm the DA, I actually get to know what the truth was about why that got filed. And it was filed because we did the press conference and the candlelight vigil, and my opponent was so freaked out that we were getting so much attention he succumbed to the pressure of filing those charges, which was the right thing to do anyway. Now think about that. That's a double-edged sword on a, all, a whole variety of levels. First of all, if he didn't think it should have been charged, he should have had the moxie not to charge it. He shouldn't have succumbed to the pressure I was putting on him. On the other hand, the pressure, and sometimes in political campaigns, can help you effectuate an end result. And that's why elections matter and why elections are so important. I mean, elections are the time you get to test where a candidate stands on issues. Because when the, once they're in office, it's a lot harder to pin them down. So it was very, very effective. And so her, her charges are now pending. So th those are the facts of the case. Um, this guy is a really bad dude. Um, he went to prison. He's a member of a street gang. He went to prison for being an accessory for murder before, and um, he's being charged with murder and felony enhancement of personal use of deadly weapon. Uh, he's looking at life without the possibility of parole. After, he was on the run for almost a week, and he's a, he's a heroin addict, and he has a baby with a woman who was providing him heroin in a motel room while he was hiding from the police. But he doesn't like needles, so he would make her shoot him up to get high. And so the allegation by her, by Tambor's attorney, 
Oh, thanks. But was that the police told her to get him high so that it would make, them e make it easier for them to arrest him when they decided they were going to arrest him. We had the whole hearing. That's not what the evidence was. But I just want you to appreciate when the stakes are this high and there's this much attention on a case, people are fighting really, really hard on both sides. And my attitude is this when it comes to prosecuting cases. I never loathe anybody for defending their client to the fullest extent of the law. That's, as lawyers, that's our ethical responsibility. You better give your client your best shot, especially on the stakes, you know, life without the possibility of parole. But we're going to do the same thing. The only difference now in the Orange County DA's office, we're not going to cheat. So the reason I, right, they cheated before in the prior administration. That's why they got kicked off cases. We're not cheating. I don't think you need to cheat to get convictions. I'm not cheating because it's unethical. I'm not losing my bar card to get a conviction on somebody. And I don't think any of my prosecutors should as well. But I sat in that courtroom three days for one reason, to find out if those deputies did engage in misconduct. Because if they had, then I might have filed charges against them as well. In other words, everybody in this county needs to play by the rules. And the reason is this, and then I'll close. If your government attorneys don't play by the rules with as much power as we have, then the judges don't trust you, the public, the juries don't trust you, no one, the media doesn't trust you, no one trusts you. <clears throat> and the reason I can go around and I can put pressure on the judges, or that judge in this particular case on hate crimes, or, or put pressure on the DA, right, on, to file against Thornburg and get the courts to back that up, is because you maintain your credibility as a prosecutor. I know in law school, right, we took contracts and all these things, and it's like, make sure you write this and write all this boilerplate and make sure you cover this angle and this angle. I wish, naive, I'm not saying it's true, but I wish we practiced law like the old days. When I shook your hand and I said something and you could take my word to the bank. We could practice law that way, quite frankly. It could happen. You can't jeopardize your client's positions by doing it. I'm not saying to do it. But that's the way it should be with my prosecutors and the defense bar. Because our word is the only thing we have. It's the only thing that matters. And I'll, I need to tell you this one story. So <clears throat> I have a prosecutor. I have a, I'm in, uh, what is it called? Arbitration, I guess, mediation. I don't know what it's called. You guys know these things. I've never done it before. So. I'm being deposed, uh, no, I have, it's arbitration. I fired in my first week in office a prosecutor who had been disbarred. She got suspended for six months for failing to turn over evidence. Not in the Seal Beach case, in a completely unrelated case. I know it sounds ridiculous, but I have this philosophy that if a prosecutor, remember all of us, if we're ever disciplined, God forbid, we ever get that letter, none of us, we all dread it, right? Or, or you look up your name. Some of you probably just look up your name on the bar website just to make sure you don't have discipline, right? Um, or they made a mistake. So she was suspended from the practice of law. Number one, I don't want prosecutors working in my office who have been suspended and upheld by the Supreme Court for misconduct. That's, I'm not employing people like that. Her position is, I should have had to keep an, a position open for her until she was eligible to practice law. It's like, no, you cheated, you're a cheater, government lawyers can't cheat, you're out of here. So that's gonna be my position when I am under oath this week. I find it fascinating that a government attorney who had been a prosecutor could assert the position that she should be able to come back into a position of trust like that after a finding by the California Supreme Court that she cheated. I have a real, real difficult time with that. And what you need to know is whether you live here, visit here, some of you are from all over the country. This is, when I told you $150 million your budget, 800 attorneys, we're the third largest DA's office in the state 
and we're the sixth largest district attorney's office in the country. So what we do here matters. And after the DA's office cheated on the Seal Beach shooting, the California legislature passed a new felony in California. And they made it a felony for prosecutors if they failed to give over evidence, they can be charged with a felony now in California. So there's a new felony just because of what happened in Orange County. So what happens here matters. And what I hope is what happens on Cheyenne's case matters nationally. I hope it matters throughout the country what we're doing on hate crimes. And what everybody needs to know is what Lindsey Graham said was completely unacceptable and that people like me will continue to point that out. That's, it's not acceptable. It was wrong. And he needs to be held accountable for that. So thanks for coming for all and debating and hearing all these issues and hearing what's going on in Orange County. I'm, I, I am just so tickled that your leadership asked me uh, to come and speak to you today because it's such an honor to be able to share with you really the kind of fundamental changes I'm trying to exact here in this great county. This is an amazing county, great place to live. Many of you do live here. And it's worth fighting for this county. But more importantly, it's worth fighting for justice every day. Thank you so much.